The medical field is positioned to be transformed by 3D printing. They're using bioprinters to make both hard and soft tissue. And earlier this year, Cornell University researchers used collagen gel to print a human ear. Does Canada have the capability and expertise to become a leader in the 3D realm? Joining us now for more in Ithaca, New York, Hod Lipson. He is director of the Creative Machines Lab at Cornell University. And with us here in studio, Fanny C, project manager at Mars Innovation, and Gordon Campbell, scientist and researcher with the National Research Council. And it's good to have you two here in our studio. Hod, nice to have you on the line from the United States. And I want to start Pleasure with you be because your new book called Fabricated has a plastic hamburger on the cover. We're looking at it right now. Tell us why you think this is, in some respects, the perfect image for the current state of 3D printing. Well, you know, there's a couple of interesting things about that uh, image. One thing, it, uh, it, it, it's, it's so unusual. It's, it highlights this idea that you can make uh, really new things, uh, things that you haven't seen before. It's not just about a new manufacturing way to make uh, old things, but it's really a comp opens up the possibility to make things you haven't seen before. But it also touches on this idea that we can work with new kinds of materials, biological materials and even food. So it's a sort of a, an iconic image, I think, that, uh, that tells all of that in one shot. How far has 3D printing gone since you first got involved with it? So uh, I first uh, uh, saw it back in the late 80s. So in fact, uh, few people know that this technology has actually been around for three decades. It's been working in factories, uh, in uh, back rooms, doing all kinds of things. But, uh, but uh, in the last couple of years, it's kind of taken a, a leap forward, I think, both in terms of public attention, but also in terms of the range of materials that can be printed. So it's gone from just printing in plastic to printing in metal, in ceramics, and, and biological materials and other exotic materials, but also creating a whole uh, range of uh, new business models that are beginning to pop up and people are beginning to realize that it's not just a, a fad, something that's going to go away, but it's really going to change things. Okay, let's follow up on some of the, before we talk business models, follow up on some of the things that can now be printed that say 20 years ago couldn't. We've heard about some examples in the medical field. Give us some examples of some other new things that have quote unquote been printed in these new 3D printers. Well, I think the, the uh, in terms of uh, industry, one of the exciting things is the ability to print uh, metal parts that are not just prototype, but are real end products. So uh, imagine, for example, uh, parts of an aircraft. Uh, increasingly, parts of real flying commercial aircrafts are being printed. So it's not just a sort of a uh, uh, for printing toys or for printing uh, prototypes. It's real products that actually have critical uh, performance. So that's a, a major development. Uh, and uh, increasingly, we're seeing things like uh, uh, I don't know tooth, uh, 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 teeth uh, braces, uh, uh, and uh, uh, ear hearing aid casing. Things that uh, are printed in the thousands per day, and many people are using it. So, I think if you walk down the streets today, chances are that people near you are actually wearing 3D printed parts without actually knowing it. So it's moved from this esoteric technology to something that's pretty mainstream, even though many people are not aware of it right now. Hmm. Okay, Fanny, let me get you involved at this point. I'm told that in Canada, at Staples, you can buy a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. Now, presumably, that's not the same 3D printer as the cutting edge stuff that we've just heard about. What's the difference? Exactly. Um, one of the most exciting projects that we have coming out of the University of Toronto is a microfluidic based printer. A which? Microfluidic based printer. Microfluidic based? Yes. Which means? Which means that it allows for unprecedented precision, allowing for the positioning of cells relative to one another, as well as the creation of microstructures that mimic the tissue environment. So it, I believe that it will follow a much rigorous regulatory path than a printer that you would find at Staples. Well, okay, what would you find at Staples? What could they do with those? With those ones, I think you could make things like jewelry, furniture, prototypes, toys. And I think uh, there's a world of possibilities and getting them into the hands of consumers makes it even more exciting because you have a whole bunch of home engineers that will end up 
putting things together, customizing it for themselves. So I'm excited to see what the world has to bring. Do, do you think when people go to Staples or wherever to buy these 3D printers, that they understand they're not buying something that can replicate a human body? Um, I think expectations are quite high right now, mm -hmm. especially with the, the advent of Star Trek and the replicator that everyone was waiting for to enter their homes in the near future. Um, I think that uh, with respect to biological tissues, I don't know if they really have the same incentives, but what they want is to do something that is enabling and that will further um, their interests or hobbies. Did you see the new Star Trek movie? I haven't, but I'm excited to see it. You haven't seen it yet? No, Given what you seen. do, you haven't seen it yet? No, I'm waiting for a friend and they haven't come back from a trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Your friend must be a good friend because yes. <laughs> you're going to love it when you see it. So. Gordon, you want to play some show and tell here? I would. Okay. In the medical field, what sort of things are 3D printers currently up to? Okay. Let me give you a couple examples. Sure. Um, this is the bones of a human hand. And it was done from a patient. And the way to do this is that the image is taken, we use MRI or CT, in a series of uh, what we call serial slices. Then they take the serial slices and they reconstruct them back into the, what the shape of the hand is. And then you can see this is in no, plastic. I'm just going to interrupt for a second. Move that glass so we can get a really good view of it, if you would. Thank you. That's great. Uh, this uh, particular hand uh, is in plastic. It's not real bone. What do we use this for? Well, if the hand had a deformation or a deformation or a, a, a disease, the surgeon could see this ahead of time, maybe uh, help him rehearse what he wants to do. You can see a diagnostic person look at this and say, I can see in here some uh, deficiencies. And so this helps uh, the medical staff understand the human body. What kind of plastic is that? This was done on a machine called stereolithography, okay? That fancy name means that it was done in an acrylic plastic. So maybe I should explain how it was made, okay? okay? What happens is that you can take the 3D shape that you want, and then within the stereolithography machine, what you do is you take that hand and you slice it into a whole series of slices, 40 mm -hmm. microns in thickness. How much is a micron? Uh, well, one millionth of a meter. Um, okay. 100 microns is a human hair. So then what the machine does is that it has a pool of polymer here. It has a control system and it has a laser. The laser is controlled by a computer and it takes the first slice of the first mi uh, 40 micron slice and it prints it on this pool. And this pool turns from a liquid to a solid. Then it, the tray moves down a little bit, then it does the second layer. Down a little bit, third layer, fourth layer, fifth layer, multiple layers until finally guess what? You've recreated that shape and with an accuracy of 40 microns. So it may take a few hours right now, but this is what you can produce with the current technology. What okay? else you got back there? So can I, so I move on to yeah. an, another situation? This is a kidney. This was done by a different uh, 3D printer. That was stereolithography. This is fused deposition modeling. That's probably what you're buying at Staples. Not to take away from you know, what you said. Fused deposition modeling is a little bit different technology, again, 3D printing. What this is, is that you have a material, uh, a model material and a support material. And it extrudes out, out. it's much like the, a filament, like in your weed eater that you use to trim your yard. Mm -hmm. It extrudes it out, and again, it builds it one layer at a time. So it takes it, now this is 100 microns thickness. So it takes the slices that you're building up, so they can like slices to build a loaf of bread. First slice, second slice, third slice, fourth slice, and there it is. There's a plastic model of a, of a kidney, all right? So it's in the shape of a kidney, it's plastic. What would you do with that, though? Well, again, I, I use this to give it to a physician or a medical specialist that says, what do you think of this? Does it look realistic? And he'll say, yes, but it's plastic, you know? It's not much good to me, okay? <laughs> so in order to make it useful to him, what we do is we've created a tissue mimicking replica. Now, this is a special material. You look made that in a 3D printer? Not quite. Okay. Let me explain this. All right. Okay, so here's a tissue mimicking uh, construct, okay? It has the same physical properties as a real kidney. It has the same imaging properties as a real kidney. It has the same shape as, as a real kidney, same anatomical shape. So this is what I'm able to make and what I produce. Now the way I produce it is I have to make molds, okay? 
Mm -hmm. So here's a mold that was used to make this one here. So we took this kidney, we created this shape on 3D printer, same machine that was used on this one, and I can produce these right now. So that's right now. That's our current status. And what can you do with that? We use this for training purposes. Specifically, how, would you, uh, how do you train people to do a tissue biopsy of a kidney? And to do a tissue biopsy of a, of a kidney, you use what's called uh, image-guided uh, techniques. And to do that, the person taking the uh, biopsy, and one hand has an ultrasound transducer or, or handpiece, and the other one has a, a needle, basically. And they look at a, at a screen, and they're watching the screen, and they're going, hmm, got hand-eye coordination here, got to see what I'm doing, pushing the needle in, and they've got to hit a target that's right there. If they miss it, they don't get their biopsy. If they go into here, well then they go inside what's called the medulla. So if I look at this particular specimen that you see here, you can see the outside which is the cortex inside this medulla. If they hit that, they're in trouble because it will cause serious complications. So what do we have to train these people? After all, you don't want to be the first subject. <laughs> well, I don't. So what we're doing now is taking that kidney, putting it inside of a torso, and using that as the first training device to, to, so to allow the new trainees, the residents and the fellows, to learn how to do a tissue biopsy of a kidney. In, inside the torso of a cadaver, I guess. No, we no? actually build the same yeah. thing, but we expand on this. We build everything out of, out of this tissue mimicking material, hmm. okay? Don't use any human whatsoever, all a synthetic material. And the, as I said, the beauty of this material, as you can see, it's wet. It has the same characteristics as real tissues. Fascinating, as Spock would say. I think, I think that the, if you take that a step further, you can imagine uh, depositing, uh, instead of using a mold, actually printing with that material directly, and even printing with multiple material types. So you can print bone and, and uh, you know, kidney tissue and muscle tissue, and really begin to recreate uh, training models and surgical planning models uh, that are increasingly realistic. Even uh, here at Cornell, we uh, frequently get a kind of uh, urgent call from the vet school to print the bones of a dog that is going into surgery. We print those bones out of plastic and the surgeons have a chance to practice with surgery before they go in and, and they can reduce the surgery by half. So uh, the time, so, so there's a lot of opportunity there uh, to do uh, fabulous things. <laughs> Can I add to that? Please. Excellent idea. Okay, <laughs> so let's me to, to help you and agree with you. Next step. I'd like to create this, what I call a soft tissue replicator. I've got the technology. I've built the uh, crude prototype. I know I can make it. You know, what I'm missing is a partner and money. But what's a soft tissue replicator? Well, we can go directly, as you say, from the image to the final component, where a surgeon could do rehearsal, which was what you're talking about, or a, someone who's a diagnostic radiologist can use it directly for doing, uh, a, a, doing a diagnosis. Soft tissue replicator, the technology exists now, just that we haven't built them yet. At least we haven't built them to the level that they're commercially viable. All Is right? that where Mars comes in? Um, yes, we do have uh, a number of possibilities or in enabling devices to create uh, soft tissue models, but um, what we're seeing more in the marketplace nowadays is sort of a half synthetic, half living model, sort of in the area of prosthetics, before we actually get to a continuum of going to the other end of the spectrum, which is actually creating entirely living organs. So I, I do believe this is the, the initiation of a very exciting uh, commercialization pads for these types of printers. Hmm. Yeah. Let's, I think we've got some, um, I think we've got some footage here from the U of T lab, Axel Gunther's lab. Yeah. Let's take a look at this, a few seconds of uh, video and then we'll come back and chat. Control room, if you would, roll tape please. When I was young, I was always very interested in building things, doing things with my hands. I would break down clocks and try to figure out how to put them back together. Lien was one of my first uh, graduate students when I started here and has invented uh, this technology. She's a very gifted uh, graduate student and uh, very talented in microfabrication. 
we have developed a capability to organize soft materials um, in, in a sheet-like uh, structure and uh, that can potentially be used for a, a skin graft. One of the possible applications is for skin, but uh, really we could do uh, blood vessels, we could do um, all kinds of tissues depending on the type of uh, cells that we, we would be using. Play this forward. What are the implications of all of that work? It's, uh, it is a very new field. And what we're trying to do right now is a lot of proof of principle work with respect to animals and creating um, artificial skin so that we can use this application for large scale burn victims. From a structural perspective, we're starting with the simplest of all tissues, which is skin it, because it's simply planar. So a lot of the focus is in the viability of the cells themselves. So the first types of experiments involve um, the creation of a living band-aid that would have implications for decreasing the time in wound healing for these types of patients. Um, we believe that this has a shorter regulatory path than actually creating something where an organ has a more complex or comprehensive structure. Building a planar piece of skin versus building a liver or a kidney where structure and function um, have a very defined role uh, may take a little bit longer with respect to clinical validation and feasibility. Um, we think that this particular printer has near-term benefits for a very large population. Near-term meaning? If all goes well, I would say on the order of three to five years, which may be uh, somewhat optimistic. However, you have the, the sort of acceleration of certain projects because of the lack of other alternatives. Now you look at the case of the child with the chronic respiratory condition in Michigan, who was allowed um, a 3D printed stent or a splint for their brachial so that they could survive. That was an expedited FDA regulatory approval and it happened and it worked. So for patients with large scale surface area burns, I think one of the only alternatives is very costly. It's, I believe a sheet on the order of three to five centimeters can be almost 30K USD. Hmm. And that's just not feasible or cost effective. 30,000 American dollars. Yes. Hmm. OK. C could I uh, offer another comment on it or a difference, a difference, uh, another perspective on this? This is the whole area of what we call tissue engineering. And that is to be able to recreate or be able to mimic human organs, human components, using a combination of cells and, and uh, synthetic materials. 40 years ago, when I started in this field, Tissue engineering was raised as a real possibility. And I was excited about that. I thought, this is really a really cool area. And the prediction was 10 to 15 years we'll have it, OK, 40 years ago. The reports I'm reading now, and this was in the last two weeks, are saying, well, we're almost there, probably another 10 to 15 years. So okay. what do you infer from all that? That we're, the, the, uh, the science hasn't progressed far enough. And let me give you an engineer's perspective of where I think the difficulty is. It's the biology. It's cells. I was in, involved in a, a project for tissue engineering and artificial heart valve. And I have to describe uh, you know, my perspective as an engineer. Cells are like spoiled brats. You've got to feed them right. You've got to find the right nutrition. You have to keep them nice and warm. And even uh, then. It, it, well, <laughs> and, and you've got to get in an incubator. Uh, you talk nice to them, no sudden noises. And finally, after many, many efforts and attempts and failures, you finally get them doing what you want, like a, a kidney cell or a skin cell. You come back from a weekend, and guess what? The little buggers have changed. <laughs> They've ended up uh, differentiating into stem cells. And this is a situation where all of your work, all of your efforts ends up getting flushed down the toilet and you start all over again. Well, Hod, let me bring you in on that point because uh, I want to give you another, we've heard a few examples here of, of some medical conditions that had this 
what seem like very futuristic solutions attached to them. I want to talk about the guy who's actually producing this program that you're participating in right now. His name's Greg Thurlbeck, and he's got a bum knee. And he, requ he required knee replacement surgery recently. And before he got the surgery, he looked into whether or not 3D printing was an option so that a 3D printer could replicate the meniscus cartilage that apparently he needed. He looked at it, mm -hmm. considered it. In the end, he decided not to do that. Um, I think not necessarily because he didn't trust it, but because it didn't have enough of a track record <clears throat> yet for him to, to put inside his knee. And I'm wondering whether you think he made the right call. That's right. No, he definitely made the right call uh, today. But, uh, but in the future, I think this, uh, I, I do, I also subscribe to the optimistic view of, you know, three to five years. Uh, certainly for tissues like our uh, cartilage, uh, which is the, for example, menis meniscus of the knee, bone, um, and uh, tissues like that are fairly amorphous. Uh, they don't have a lot of vascularity. They are the, uh, quote unquote, lowest hanging fruit uh, in terms of uh, tissue engineering. And that technology for making those kinds of tissues fairly uh, it, within reach. The, the challenge, just to, to emphasize what was just said, is that unlike printing in plastic or printing in metal, uh, when you print with live cells, there's no start button, so to speak. You don't print it and then that's it, the tissue is ready. It's more like uh, planting a garden. That's, I think, the, a good analogy. You put the cells in the right places and then uh, you have to wait. You have to wait for the cells to sort of uh, excrete the intracellular materials to connect each other to start working together as a tissue and that is uh, that's the part where, where the biology is not well understood uh, and uh, we try to do that uh, in various ways I, I like the analogy of spoiled bracts because one of the ways to get uh, meniscus tissue to actually work for example is to beat it up a little bit to to put it uh, in some tough environment uh, until it kind of shapes up and uh, becomes ready to withstand the impacts of a knee. So you don't just take the printed meniscus and implant it, you have to incubate it, put it in a bioreactor and so forth. The same thing if you're printing a heart valve. Uh, you don't just print it and implant it, but uh, work here uh, done by uh, 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 Jonathan Butcher uh, is uh, all about printing heart valves and actually putting them in a reactor with simulated blood flow to make sure this uh, heart valve shapes up uh, before it's actually implanted. So there's huge potential, but there's also a few important pieces of the puzzle that we don't understand yet. But I think in the, in the longer term, it will be some, almost uh, a norm that you, uh, when you're young and healthy, you get a full body MRI scan, you save it on file, and when you need uh, a new body part, uh, you call it up and have it printed. And you will own the machine and do that yourself? Oh, no, absolutely not. This is, uh, you know, this is a whole other debate of where these machines are and how they're regulated and who gets to do this. Uh, but uh, certainly this is not a machine that you buy uh, and own at home. This, these machines will be in hospitals. It, it's it's fairly complex process even when it works well. Okay, Gordon, follow up on that, if you would, by answering this. Uh, there will be a point, maybe not to do the kinds of things we just referred to, but there will be a point where these home bioprinters or some, whatever, 3D printers are going to be obviously more commonplace than they are today. And I wonder what you think the ethical implications are of people owning these devices almost as if they were as commonplace as toasters. I think when you're talking about a home printer, what are the applications for our home situation? Uh, there are, there's a couple of uh, considerations here. One, there's what we call the hobbyist market. The hobbyist market uh, is a group of people who would like to build components and parts. And right now, there are products available for the ho ho hobbyist market. And they can borrow, make small parts, replacement parts for your lawnmower. Uh, they can <coughs> make uh, jewelry and things like that. However, there's a couple of other steps we look here. One is the opportunity to uh, print for drugs, medicines. So instead of having a handful of medicines that a person must take every single day, imagine 3D printing one pill, everything's in there, you take it once a day, and that's it. And you can make it yourself? You can make it yourself. It's on command. So you push the button, 
It, it has the ability to formulate what's in there, put the pill together, s spit it out, and you take it and you t uh, put it in your mouth and that's it. So you don't have to go to the drugstore anymore to buy it? No. This is the future. This is not yet here yet, but this is the concept that we're talking about. And I think it, Big Pharma is about to have a heart attack I if think they it, hear this. Go ahead, Hog. What were you saying? Well, I think... I, th I think the, the uh, uh, first of all, the, the prescription would be regulated externally. So it's not that you decide what's in the pill, but the pill is that, printed on demand. True, true. But I think uh, it, 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 gets, it gets more uh, exciting when you combine it with food. Uh, so I'm, uh, uh, you know, I think that the real future of, of home printers is not bioprinting, but it, it's a very similar technology, and that's food printing. Same kind of issues, use same kinds of materials, without all the regulation. So you can imagine that uh, you know, s uh, certain uh, types of food that you print might uh, be uh, somehow linked to uh, your biometrics, to drugs that you need, to uh, sugar levels that are appropriate, uh, and so forth. So uh, it's not uh, necessarily just a medical printer or just a plastic printer. You can really start seeing uh, that it goes into other uh, parts of our life in, in other ways. Fanny, I've got a minute left here. Do you think there's anything we can do to build safeguards into this technology so that these consumer printers, let's say, the ones that would be as omnipresent in the home as a toaster, don't do things that um, are problematic? I think what's important is to recognize that the bioprinter itself is an enabling technology that doesn't have a bias towards good or bad. It really is about the application that you move it towards or progress it to. I think what you can try and do is regulate the types of cartridges that go into your food printer. So if there are drugs to be placed in it, then you know those cartridges that have the drugs should be regulated or um, a particular procedure or operations attached to it. But I do believe in um, what Hod just commented on. The food is going to be the, one of the biggest markets out there. NASA just uh, invested money into a pizza printer from Mars. So. Well, we know what the hamburger on the front of his book looks like. Doesn't look all that appetizing, but maybe it will be in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. Hod Lipson, it's good of you to join us on the line from Ithaca, New York, from the Creative Machines Lab at Cornell University. Thanks so much. And here in our studios, Fanny C., the project manager at the Mars Innovation in Toronto, and Gordon Campbell from the National Research Council. Thanks so much, everybody. You're welcome. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.